This is the fourth lesson of the AWS Solutions Architect course. Migrating to the cloud doesn't mean that resources become completely separated from the local infrastructure. In fact, running applications in the cloud will be completely transparent to your end users. AWS offers a number of services to fully and seamlessly integrate your local resources with the cloud. One such service is the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. This lesson talks about creating virtual networks that closely resemble the ones that operate in your own data centers, but with the added benefit of being able to take full advantage of AWS. So let's get started. In this lesson, you'll learn all about virtual private clouds and understand their concept. You'll know the difference between public, private, and elastic IP addresses. You'll learn about what a public and private subnet is. And you'll understand what an internet gateway is and how it's used. You'll learn what root tables are and when they are used. You'll understand what a NAT gateway is. We'll take a look at security groups and their importance. And we'll take a look at network ACLs and how they're used in Amazon VPC. We'll also review the Amazon VPC best practices and also the costs associated with running a VPC in the Amazon cloud. Welcome to the Amazon virtual private cloud and subnet section. In this section, we're going to have an overview of what Amazon VPC is and how you use it. And we're also going to have a demonstration of how to create your own custom virtual private cloud. We're going to look at IP addresses and the use of elastic IP addresses in AWS. And finally, we'll take a look at subnets and there'll be a demonstration about how to create your own subnets in an Amazon VPC. And here are some of the terms that are used in VPCs. There's subnets, root tables, elastic IP addresses, internet gateways, NAT gateways, network ACLs, and security groups. And in the next sections, we're gonna take a look at each of these and build our own custom VPC that we'll use throughout this course. Amazon defines a VPC as a virtual private cloud that enables you to launch AWS resources into a virtual network that you've defined. This virtual network closely resembles a traditional network that you'd operate in your own data center, but with the benefits of using the scalable infrastructure of AWS. A VPC is your own virtual network in the Amazon cloud, which is used as the network layer for your EC2 resources. And this is a diagram of the default VPC. Now there's a lot going on here, so don't worry about that. What we're gonna do is break down each of the individual items in this default VPC over the coming lesson. But what you need to know is that a VPC is a critical part of the exam, and you need to know all the concepts and how it differs from your own networks. Throughout this lesson, we're going to create our own VPC from scratch, which you'll need to replicate at the end of this so you can do well in the exam. Each VPC that you create is logically isolated from other virtual networks in the AWS cloud. It's fully customizable. You can select the IP address range, create subnets, configure root tables, set up network gateways, define security settings using security groups and network access control lists. So each Amazon account comes with a default VPC that's pre-configured for you to start using straight away. So you can launch your EC2 instances without having to think about anything we mentioned in the opening section. A VPC can span multiple availability zones in a region. And here's a very basic diagram of a VPC. It isn't this simple in reality. And as we saw in the first section, here's the default Amazon VPC, which looks kind of complicated. But what we need to know at this stage is the CIDR block for the default VPC is always a 16 subnet mask. So in this example, it's 172.31.0.0 slash 16. And what that means is this VPC will provide up to 65,536 private IP addresses. So in the coming sections, we'll take a look at all of these different items that you can see on this default VPC. 
But why wouldn't you just use the default VPC? Well, the default VPC is great for launching new instances when you're testing AWS. But creating a custom VPC allows you to make things more secure and you can customize your virtual network as you can define your own IP address range. You can create your own subnets that are both private and public and you can tighten down your security settings. By default, instances that you launch into a VPC can't communicate with your own network. So you can connect your VPCs to your existing data center using something called hardware VPN access so that you can effectively extend your data center into the cloud and create a hybrid environment. Now to do this, you need a virtual private gateway and this is the VPN concentrator on the Amazon side of the VPN connection. Then on your side in your data center, you need a customer gateway, which is either a physical device or a software application that sits on your side of the VPN connection. So when you create a VPN connection, a VPN tunnel comes up when traffic is generated from your side of the connection. VPC peering is an important concept to understand. A peering connection could be made between your own VPCs or with a VPC in another AWS account as long as it's in the same region. So what that means is if you have instances in VPC A, they wouldn't be able to communicate with instances in VPC B or C unless you set up a peering connection. Peering is a one-to-one -one relationship. A VPC can have multiple peering connections to other VPCs, but, and this is important, transitive peering is not supported. In other words, VPC A can connect to B and C in this diagram, but C wouldn't be able to communicate with B unless they were directly peered. Also, VPCs with overlapping CIDRs cannot be peered. So in this diagram, you can see they all have different IP ranges, which is fine. But if they had the same IP ranges, they wouldn't be able to be peered. And finally for this section, if you delete the default VPC, you have to contact AWS support to get it back again. So be careful with it and only delete it if you have good reason to do so and know what you're doing. This is a demonstration of how to create a custom VPC. So here we are back at the Amazon Web Services Management Console. And this time we're going to go down to the bottom left where the networking section is. I'm going to click on VPC. And the VPC dashboard will load up. Now there's a couple of ways you can create a custom VPC. There's something called the VPC wizard which will build VPCs on your behalf from a selection of different configurations. For example, a VPC with a single public subnet or a VPC with public and private subnets. Now this is great because you click a button, type in a few details and it does the work for you. However, you're not gonna learn much or pass the exam if this is how you do it. So we'll cancel that and we'll go to your VPCs and we'll click on create a VPC and we're presented with the create a VPC window. So let's give our VPC a name. I'm going to call it simply learn underscore VPC. And this is the kind of naming convention I'll be using throughout this course. Next, we need to give it the CIDR block or the classless interdomain routing block. So we're going to give it a very simple one, 10.0.0.0. And then we need to give it the subnet mask. So you're not allowed to go larger than 15. So if I try to put 15 in, it says, no, not going to happen. For a reference, subnet mask of 15 would give you around 131,000 IP addresses. And subnet 16 will give you 65,536, which is probably more than enough for what we're going to do. Next, you get to choose the tenancy. And there's two options, default and dedicated. If you select dedicated, then your EC2 instances will reside on hardware that's dedicated to you. So your performance is going to be great, but your cost is going to be significantly higher. So I'm going to stick with default and we just click on yes, create. It'll take a couple of seconds. And then in our VPC dashboard, we can see our simply learn VPC has been created. Now, if we go down to the bottom here to see the information about our new VPC, we can see it has a root table associated with it. 
which is our default root table. So there it is. And we can see that it's only allowing local traffic at the moment. If we go back to the VPC again. We can see it's been given a default network ACL. And we'll click on that and have a look. And you can see this is very similar to what we looked at in the lesson. So it's allowing all traffic from all sources inbound and outbound. Now if we go to the subnet section and just widen the VPC area here, you can see there's no subnets associated with the VPC we just created. So that means we won't be able to launch any instances into our VPC. And to prove it, I'll just show you. We'll go to the EC2 section. So this is a glimpse into your future. This is what we'll be looking at in the next lesson. And we'll just quickly try and launch an instance. We'll select any instance, it doesn't matter. Any size, not important. So here, the network section, if I try and select Simply Learn VPC, it's saying no subnets found, this is not going to work. So we basically need to create some subnets in our VPC. And that is what we're going to look at in the next lesson. Now, private IP addresses are IP addresses that are not reachable over the internet. And they're used for communication between instances in the same network. When you launch a new instance, it's given a private IP address and an internal DNS host name that resolves to the private IP address of the instance. But if you want to connect to this from the internet, it's not going to work. So then you'd need a public IP address, which is reachable from the internet. You can use public IP addresses for communication between your instances and the internet. Each instance that receives a public IP address is also given an external DNS host name. Public IP addresses are associated with your instances from the Amazon pool of public IP addresses. When you stop or terminate your instance, the public IP address is released and a new one is associated when the instance starts. So if you want your instance to retain its public IP address, you need to use something called an elastic IP address. An elastic IP address is a static or persistent public IP address that's allocated to your account and can be associated to and from your instances as required. An elastic IP address remains in your account until you choose to release it. There is a charge associated with an elastic IP address if it's in your account but not actually allocated to an instance. This is a demonstration of how to create an elastic IP address. So we're back at the Amazon Web Services Management Console. We're going to head back down to the networking VPC section and we'll get to the VPC dashboard. On the left hand side, we'll click on Elastic IPs. Now you'll see a list of any Elastic IPs that you have associated in your account. And remember, any v Elastic IP address that you're using that isn't allocated to something, you'll be charged for. So I have one available and that is allocated to an instance currently. So we want to allocate a new address and it reminds you that there's a charge if you're not using it. I'm saying yes, allocate. And it takes a couple of seconds. And there's our new Elastic IP address. Now we'll be using this IP address to associate with the NAT gateway when we build that. AWS defines a subnet as a range of IP addresses in your VPC. You can launch AWS resources into a subnet that you select. You can use a public subnet for resources that must be connected to the internet and a private subnet for resources that won't be connected to the internet. The net mask for the default subnet in your VPC is always 20, which provides up to 4096 addresses per subnet, and a few of them are reserved for AWS use. A VPC can span multiple availability zones. But a subnet is always mapped to a single availability zone. This is important to know. So here's our basic diagram, which we're now going to start adding to. So we can see the virtual private cloud, and you can see the availability zones. 
and now inside each availability zone we've created a subnet. Now you won't be able to launch any instances unless there are subnets in your VPC. So it's good to spread them across availability zones for redundancy and failover purposes. There's two different types of subnet, public and private. You use a public subnet for resources that must be connected to the internet, for example web servers. A public subnet is made public because the main root table sends the subnet's traffic that is destined for the internet to the internet gateway. And we'll touch on internet gateways next. Private subnets are for resources that don't need an internet connection or that you want to protect from the internet, for example, database instances. So in this demonstration, we're going to create some subnets, a public and a private subnet, and we're going to put them in our custom VPC in different availability zones. So we'll head to networking and VPC, wait for the VPC dashboard to load up. We'll click on subnets. We'll go to create subnet. And I'm going to give the subnet a name. So it's good to give them meaningful names. So I'm going to call this first one for the public subnet 10.0.1.0. And I'm going to put this one in the US East 1B availability zone. And I'm going to call that simply learn public. So it's quite a long name, I understand, but at least it makes it clear for what, what's going on in this example. So we need to choose a VPC. So we obviously want to put it in our Simply Learn VPC. And I said I wanted to put it in US East 1B. I'm using the North Virginia region, by the way. So we click on that. Then we need to give it the CIDR block. Now, as I mentioned earlier, when I typed in the name, that's the range I want to use. And then we need to give it the subnet mask and we're going to go with 24 which should give us 251 addresses in this range which obviously is going to be more than enough if I try and put a different value in that's unacceptable to Amazon it's going to say you know, it's going to give me an error and tell me not to do that let's go back to 24 and click on a cut and paste this by the way just because I need to type something very similar for the next one click create it takes a few seconds. Okay, so there's our new subnet. And if I just widen this, you can see, so that's the IP range, that's the availability zone, it's for simply learn, and it's public. So now we want to create the private. So I'm going to put the name in. I'm going to give the private the IP address block of that. I'm going to put this one in US East 1C and it's going to be the private subnet. Obviously I want it to be in the same VPC, availability zone of US East 1C and we're going to give it 10.0.2.0-24. And we'll click yes create. And again, it takes a few seconds. Okay, so we sort by name. So there we are, we can see now we've got our private subnet and our public subnet. In fact, let me just type in simply learn. There we are. So now you can see them both there. And you can see they're both in the same VPC, simply learn VPC. Now, if we go down to the bottom, you can see the root table associated with these VPCs. And you can see that they can communicate with each other internally, but there's no internet access. So that's what we need to do next. In the next lesson, you're going to learn about internet gateways and how we can make these subnets have internet access. Welcome to the networking section. In this section, we're going to take a look at internet gateways, root tables, and NAT devices. And we'll have a demonstration on how to create each of these AWS VPC items.
So to allow your VPC the ability to connect to the internet, you need to attach an internet gateway. And you can only attach one internet gateway per VPC. So attaching an internet gateway is the first stage in permitting internet access to instances in your VPC. Now here's our diagram again, and now we've added the internet gateway, which is providing the connection to the internet to your VPC. But before you can configure internet correctly, there's a couple more steps. For an EC2 instance to be internet connected, you have to adhere to the following rules. Firstly, you have to attach an internet gateway to your VPC, which we just discussed. Then you need to ensure that your instances have public IP addresses or elastic IP addresses, so they're able to connect to the internet. Then you need to ensure that your subnet's root table points to the internet gateway, and you need to ensure that your network access control and security group rules allow relevant traffic to flow to and from your instance. So you need to allow the rules to let in the traffic you want, for example, HTTP traffic. After the demonstration for this section, we're going to look at how root tables, access control lists, and security groups are used. In this demonstration, we're going to create an internet gateway and attach it to our custom VPC. So let's go to networking VPC, bring up the VPC dashboard, and on the left hand side, we click on internet gateways. So here's a couple of internet gateways I have already, um, but I need to create a new one. So create internet gateway. I'll give it a name, which is going to be simply learn internet gateway, IGW. And I'm going to click create. So this is an internet gateway which will connect a VPC to the internet because at the moment our custom VPC has no internet access. So there it's created. Simply learn IGW. But its state is detached because it's not attached to anything. So let me try and attach it to a VPC. And it gives me an option of all the VPCs that have no internet gateway attached to them currently. So I only have one, which is simply learn VPC. Yes, attach. Now you can see our VPC has internet attached, and you can see that down here. So let's click on that, and it will take us to our VPC. But before any instances in our VPC can access the internet, we need to ensure that our subnet root table points to the internet gateway. And we don't want to change the main root table, we want to create a custom root table. And that's what you're going to learn about next. A root table determines where network traffic is directed. It does this by defining a set of rules. Every subnet has to be associated with a root table, and a subnet can only be associated with one root table. However, multiple subnets can be associated with the same root table. Every VPC has a default root table, and it's good practice to leave this in its original state and create a new root table to customize the network traffic routes associated with your VPC. So here's our example, and we've added two root tables, the main root table and the custom root table. The new root table, or the custom root table, will tell the internet gateway to direct internet traffic to the public subnet but the private subnet is still associated to the default root table, the main root table, which does not allow internet traffic to it. All traffic inside the private subnet is just remaining local. In this demonstration, we're going to create a custom root table, associate it with our internet gateway, and associate our public subnet with it. So let's go to networking and VPC. The dashboard will load and we're going to go to route tables. Now our VPC only has its main route table at the moment, the default one it was given at the time it was created. So we want to create a new route table and we want to give it a name. So we're going to call it simply learn. I'm going to call it route table, RTB for short. And then we get to pick which VPC we want to put it in. So obviously we want to use Simply Learn VPC. So we click Create. 
It'll take a couple of seconds and here you are. Here's our new root table. So what we need to do now is change its root so that it points to the internet gateway. So if we go down here to roots, at the minute you can see it's just like our main root table. It just has local access. So we want to click on edit and we want to add another root. So the destination is the internet, which is all the zeros. And our target, and we click on this, it gives us the option of our internet gateway, which we want to do. So now we have internet access to this subnet, sorry, to this root table. And we click on save. Save was successful. So now we can see that as well as local access, we have internet access. Now at the moment, if we click on subnet associations, you do not have any subnet associations. So basically both, both our subnets, the public and private subnets are associated with the main root table, which doesn't have internet access. So we want to change this. So we'll click on edit and we want our public subnet to be associated with this root table. Let's so click on save. So it's just saving that. So now we can see that our public subnet is associated with this route table and this route table is associated with the internet gateway. So now anything we launch into the public subnet will have internet access. But what if we wanted our instances in the private subnet to have internet access? Well, there's a way of doing that with a NAT device, and that's what we're gonna look at in the next lecture. You can use a NAT device to enable instances in a private subnet to connect to the internet or other AWS services, but prevent the internet from initiating connections with the instances in the private subnet. So we talked earlier about public and private subnets to protect your assets from being directly connected to the internet. For example, your web server would sit in the public subnet and your database in the private subnet, which has no internet connectivity. However, your private subnet database instance might still need internet access or the ability to connect to other AWS resources. If so, you can use a network address translation device or a NAT device to do this. A NAT device forwards traffic from your private subnet to the internet or other AWS services and then sends the response back to the instances. When traffic goes to the internet, the source IP address of your instance is replaced with the NAT device address. And when the internet traffic comes back again, the NAT device translates the address to your instance's private IP address. So here's our diagram, which is getting ever more complicated. And if you look in the public subnet, you can see we've now added a NAT device. And you have to put NAT devices in the public subnet so that they get internet connectivity. AWS provides two kinds of NAT devices, a NAT gateway and a NAT instance. AWS recommends a NAT gateway as it's a managed service that provides better availability and bandwidth than NAT instances. Each NAT gateway is created in a specific availability zone and is implemented with redundancy in that zone. A NAT instance is launched from a NAT AMI, an Amazon machine image, and runs as an instance in your VPC so it's something else you have to look after. Whereas a NAT gateway being a fully managed service means once it's installed, you can pretty much forget about it. A NAT gateway must be launched into a public subnet because it needs internet connectivity. It also needs an elastic IP address, which you can select at the time of launch. Once created, you need to update the root table associated with your private subnet to point internet bound traffic to the NAT gateway. This way, the instances in your private subnets can communicate with the internet. So if you remember back to the diagram when we had the custom root table, which was pointed to the internet gateway, now we're pointing our main root table to the NAT gateway so that the private subnet also gets internet access, but in a more secure manner. Welcome to the Create a NAT Gateway demonstration, where we're gonna create a NAT gateway so that the instances in our private subnet can get internet access. So we'll start by going to networking and VPC. And the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at our subnets. 
and you'll see why shortly. So here are our Simply Learn subnets. So this is the private subnet that we want to give internet access. But if you remember from the section, NAT gateways need to be placed in public subnets. So I'm just going to copy the name of this subnet ID for the public subnet, and you'll see why in a moment. So then we go to NAT gateways on the left hand side, and we want to create a new NAT gateway. So we have to put a subnet in there. So we want to choose our public subnet. Now, as you can see, it truncates a lot of the subnet names on this option, so it's a bit confusing. So we know that we want to put it in our Simply Learn VPC in the public subnet, but you can see it's truncated. So it's actually this one at the bottom, but what I'm going to do is just paste in the subnet ID, which I copied earlier, so there's no confusion. Then we need to give it an elastic IP address. Now, if you remember from the earlier demonstration, we created one, so let's select that. But if you hadn't allocated one, you could click on the Create New EIP button. So we'll do that. OK, so it's telling me my NAT gateway has been created. And in order to use your NAT gateway, ensure that you edit your root table to include a root with a target of and then our NAT gateway ID. So it's given us the option to click on our edit root tables. So we'll go straight there. Now here's our, here's our root tables. Now, here's the custom root table that we created earlier, and this is the default, the main root table which was created when we launched our when we created our VPC. So we should probably give this a name so that we know what it is. So let me just call this simply learn RTB main. So now we know that's our main root table. So if you take a look at the main root table and the subnet associations, you can see that our private subnet is associated with this table. So what we need to do is put a root in here that points to the NAT gateway. So if we click on Roots and Edit, and we want to add another root, and we want to say that all traffic can either go to the simply the internet gateway, which we don't want to do, we want to point it to our NAT instance, which is this NAT ID here. And we click Save. So now any instances launched in our private subnet will be able to get internet access via our NAT gateway. Welcome to the Using Security Groups and Network ACL section. In this section, we're going to take a look at security groups and network ACLs, and we're going to have a demonstration on how you create both of these items in the Amazon Web Services console. A security group acts as a virtual firewall that controls the traffic for one or more instances. You add rules to each security group that allow traffic to or from its associated instances. Basically, a security group controls the inbound and outbound traffic for one or more EC2 instances. Security groups can be found on both the EC2 and VPC dashboards in the AWS Web Management Console. We're going to cover them here in this section and you'll see them crop up again in the EC2 lesson. And here is our diagram and you can see we've now added security groups to it. And you can see that EC2 instances are sitting inside the security groups and the security groups will control what traffic flows in and out. So let's take a look at some examples and we'll start with a security group for a web server. Now obviously a web server needs HTTP and HTTPS traffic as a minimum to be able to access it. So here is an example of the security group table and you can see we're allowing HTTP and HTTPS, the ports that are associated with those two and the sources, and we're allowing it from the internet. We're basically allowing all traffic to those ports. And that means any other traffic that comes in on different ports would be unable to reach the security group and the instances inside it. Let's take a look at an example for a database server security group. Now, imagine you have a SQL Server database. Then you would need to open up the SQL Server port so that people can access it. Um, which is port 1433 by default. So we've added that to the table and we've allowed the source to come from the internet. 
Now, because it's a Windows machine, you might want RDP access so you can log on and do some administration. So we've also added RDP access to the security group. Now, you could leave it open to the internet, but that would mean anyone could try and hack their way into your box. So in this example, we've added a source IP address of 10.0.0.0. So only IP arranges from that address can RDP to the instance. Now, there's a few rules associated with security groups. By default, security groups allow all outbound traffic. So if you want to tighten that down, you can do so in a similar way to you can define the inbound traffic. Security group rules are always permissive. You can't create rules that deny access, so you're allowing access rather than denying it. Security groups are stateful, so if you send a request from your instance, the response traffic for that request is allowed to flow in regardless of the inbound security group rules. And you can modify the rules of a security group at any time and the rules are applied immediately. Welcome to the Create Security Group demonstration where we're going to create two security groups, one to host DB servers and one to host web servers. Now, if you remember from the best practices section, it said it was always a good idea to tier your applications into security groups, and that's exactly what we're going to do. So if we go to networking and VPC to bring up the VPC dashboard, on the left-hand side, under security, we click on security groups. Now you can also get to security groups from the EC2 dashboard as well. So here's a list of my existing security groups, but we want to create a new security group. And we're going to call it Simply Learn Web Server SG Security Group. And we'll give the group name as the same. And our description is going to be Simply Learn Web Servers security groups okay and then we need to select our VPC now it defaults to the default VPC but obviously we want to put it in our simply learn VPC so we click yes create it takes a couple of seconds and there it is there's our new security group now if we go down to the rules the inbound rules you can see there are none. So by default, a new security group has no inbound rules. But what about outbound rules? If you remember from the lesson, a new security group by default allows all traffic to be outbound. And there you are, all traffic has destination of everywhere. So all traffic is allowed. But we want to add some rules. So let's click on inbound rules, click on edit. Now this is going to be a web server. So if we click on the drop down. We need to give it HTTP. So you can either choose custom TCP rule and type in your own port ranges, or you can just use the ones they have for you. So HTTP, this pre-populates the port range. And then here you can add the source. Now, if I click on it, it's given me the option of saying, allow access from different security groups. So you could create a security group and say, I only accept traffic from a different security group, which is a nice way of securing things down. You could also put in here just your IP address so that only you could do HTTP requests to the instance. But because it's a web server, we want people to be able to see our website. Otherwise, it's not going to be much use. So we're going to say all traffic. So all source traffic can access our instance on port HTTP 80. I want to add another rule because we also want to do HTTPS, which is hiding from me. There we are. And again, we want to do the same. And also, because this is going to be a Linux instance, we want to be able to connect to the Linux instance to do some work and configuration. So we need to give it SSH access. And again, it would be good practice to tie it down to your specific IP or an IP range. But we're just going to do all for now. And then we click on Save. And there we are. There we have our ranges. So now we want to create our security group for our DB servers. So let's click Create Security Group. And then we'll go through it and give it a similar name. Simply Learn DB Servers SG. And the description is going to be Simply Learn DB Servers Security Group. 
and our VPC is obviously going to be Simply Learn VPC. So let's click Yes Create, we'll wait a few seconds. And here's our new security group. As you can see, it has no inbound rules by default, and outbound rules allow all traffic. So this is going to be a SQL Server database server. And so we need to allow SQL Server traffic into the instance. So we need to give it Microsoft SQL port access. Now the default port for Microsoft SQL Server is 1433. Now in reality, I'd probably change the port the SQL Server was running on to make it more secure. But we'll go with this for now. And then the source. So we could choose the IP arranges again. But what we want to do is place the DB server in the private subnet and allow the traffic to come from the web server. So the web server will accept traffic and the web server will then go to the database to get the information it needs to display on its web on the website. Or if people are entering information into the website, we want the, the information to be stored in our DB server. So basically we want to say that this the DB servers can only accept SQL Server traffic from the web server security group. So we can select the Simply Learn web server security group as the source traffic for Microsoft SQL Server data. So we'll select that. Now our SQL Server is obviously going to be a Windows instance. So from time to time we might, not, might, we might need to log in and configure it. So we will just give RDP access. Now again, you would probably put a specific IP range in there. We're just going to do all traffic for now. Then we click save. And there we are. So now we have two security groups, DB servers and web servers. A network ACL is a network access control list. And it's an optional layer of security for your VPC that acts as a firewall for controlling traffic in and out of one or more of your subnets. You might set up network ACLs with rules similar to your security groups in order to add an additional layer of security to your VPC. Here is our network diagram and we've added network ACLs to the mix. Now you can see they sit somewhere between the root tables and the subnets. This diagram makes it a little bit clearer and you can see that a network ACL sits in between a root table and a subnet. And also you can see an example of the default network ACL, which is configured to allow all traffic to flow in and out of the subnets to which it's associated. Each network ACL includes a rule whose rule number is an asterisk. This rule ensures that if a packet doesn't match any of the other numbered rules, it's denied. You can't modify or remove this rule. So if you take a look at this table, you can see on the inbound, some traffic would come in and it would look for the first rule, which is 100. And that's saying, I'm allowing all traffic from all sources. So that's fine, the traffic comes in. If that rule 100 wasn't there, it would go to the asterisk rule. And the asterisk rule is saying, traffic from all sources is denied. Let's take a look at the network ACL rules. Each subnet in your VPC must be associated with an ACL. If you don't assign it to a custom ACL, it will automatically be associated to your default ACL. A subnet can only be associated with one ACL. However, an ACL can be associated with multiple subnets. An ACL contains a list of numbered rules which are evaluated in order, starting with the lowest. As soon as a rule matches traffic, it's applied regardless of any higher numbered rules that may contradict it. AWS recommends incrementing your rules by a factor of 100, so there's plenty of room to implement new rules at a later date. Unlike security groups, ACLs are stateless. Responses to allowed inbound traffic are subject to the rules for outbound traffic. Welcome to the network ACL demonstration. Well, we're just going to have an overview of ACLs where they are in the dashboard. Now, you don't need to know a huge amount about them for the exam. You just need to know how they work and where they are. So let's go to networking and VPC. And on, when the dashboard loads on the left hand side under security, there's network ACLs. So let's click on that. Now you can see some ACLs that are in my, my AWS account. So we want the one that's associated with our Simply Learn VPC. So if we extend this VPC column, 
that's our network ACL there, simply then VPC. Now let's give it a name because it's not very clear to see otherwise. Also, I'm kind of an obsessive tagger. So let's call it simply learn ACL and click on the tick. So there we are. So now it's much easier to see. So we click on inbound rules. So this is exactly what we showed you in the lesson. The rule is 100. So that's the first rule that's going to get evaluated and it's saying allow all traffic from all sources. And the outbound rules are the same. So if you wanted to tighten down the new rule, you could click edit. We would give it a new rule number, say which would be 200. So you should always increment them in 100. So that means if you had 99 more rules you needed to put in place, you'd have space to put them in in between these two. And then you could do whatever you wanted. You could say, you know, we are allowing HTTP access from all traffic and we're allowing, or you could say, actually, you know what, we're going to deny it. So this is the way of blacklisting traffic into your VPC. Now, I'm not going to save that because we don't need it. But this is where network ACL sit, and this is where you would make any changes. It's also worth having a look at the subnet associations with your ACL. So we have two subnets in our SimpliLearn VPC, so we would expect to see both of them associated with this network ACL because it's the default. And there they are. There's both our public and our private subnets are associated. And you can also see up here on the on the dashboard, it says default. So this is telling us this is our default ACL. If you did want to create a new network ACL, you would click create network ACL. You'd give it a name, just say new ACL. And then you would associate it with your VPC. So we would say simply learn VPC. takes a few seconds and there we are there we have our new one now you can see this one says default no because it obviously isn't the default ACL for our simply learn VPC and it has no subnets associated with it so let's just delete that because we don't need it but there you are there's a very brief overview of network ACLs Welcome to the Amazon VPC Best Practices and Costs, where we're going to take a look at the best practices and the costs associated with the Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. Always use public and private subnets. You should use private subnets to secure resources that don't need to be available to the internet, such as database services. To provide secure internet access to the instances that reside in your private subnets, you should provide a NAT device when using NAT devices, you should use a NAT gateway over NAT instances because they're a managed service and require less administration effort. You should choose your CIDR blocks carefully. Amazon VPC can contain from 16 to 65,536 IP addresses, so you should choose your CIDR block according to how many instances you think you'll need. You should also create separate Amazon VPCs for development, staging, test and production, or create one Amazon VPC with separate subnets, with a subnet each for production, development, staging and test. You should understand the Amazon VPC limits. There are various limitations on the VPC components. For example, you're allowed five VPCs per region, 200 subnets per VPC, 200 root tables per VPC, 500 security groups per VPC, 50 in and outbound rules per VPC. However, some of these rules can be increased by raising a ticket with AWS support. You should use security groups and network ACLs to secure the traffic coming in and out of your VPC. Amazon advises to use security groups for whitelisting traffic and network ACLs for blacklisting traffic. Amazon recommends tiering your security groups. You should create different security groups for different tiers of your infrastructure architecture inside VPC. If you have web tiers and DB tiers, you should create different security groups for each of them. Creating tier-wise security groups will increase the infrastructure security inside the Amazon VPC. So if you launch all your web servers in the web server security group, that means they'll automatically all have HTTP and HTTPS open Conversely, the database security group will have SQL Server ports already open. 
You should also standardize your security group naming conventions. Following a security group naming convention allows Amazon VPC operation and management for large-scale deployments to become much easier. Always span your Amazon VPC across multiple subnets in multiple availability zones inside a region. This helps in architecting high availability inside your VPC. If you choose to create a hardware VPN connection to your VPC using Virtual Private Gateway, you are charged for each VPN connection hour that your VPN connection is provisioned and available. Each partial VPN connection hour consumed is billed as a full hour. You'll also incur standard AWS data transfer charges for all data transferred via the VPN connection. If you choose to create a NAT gateway in your VPC, you are charged for each NAT gateway hour that your NAT gateway is provisioned and available. Data processing charges apply for each gigabyte processed through the NAT gateway. Each partial NAT gateway hour consumed is billed as a full hour. This is the practice assignment for designing a custom VPC, where you'll create a custom VPC using the concepts learnt in this lesson. Using the concepts learnt in this lesson, recreate the custom VPC as shown in the demonstrations. The VPC name should be Simply Learn VPC. The CIDR block should be 10.0.0.0/16. There should be two subnets, one public with a range of 10.0.1.0 and one private with a range of 10.0.2.0, and they should be placed in separate availability zones. There should be one internet gateway and one NAT gateway, and also one custom root table for the public subnet. Also create two security groups, Simply Learn Web Server Security Group and Simply Learn DB Server Security Group. So let's review the key takeaways from this lesson. Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC, enables you to launch AWS resources into a virtual network that you've defined. This virtual network closely resembles a traditional network that you'd operate in your own data center but with the benefits of using scalable infrastructure of AWS. There are three types of IP address in AWS. A private IP address. This is an IP address that's not reachable over the internet, and it's used for communication between instances in the same network. A public IP address is reachable from the internet, which you can use for communication between your instances and the internet. And there's an elastic IP address, this is a static, public, persistent IP address that persists after an instance restarts, whereas a public IP address is re-associated after each restart. Amazon defines a subnet as a range of IP addresses in your VPC. You can launch AWS resources into a subnet that you select, and a subnet is always mapped to a single availability zone. Use a public subnet for resources that must be connected to the internet, and a private subnet for resources that won't be connected to the internet. To allow your VPC the ability to connect to the internet, you need to attach an internet gateway to it. And you can only attach one internet gateway per VPC. A root table determines where network traffic is directed. It does this by defining a set of rules. Every subnet has to be associated with a root table, and a subnet can only have an association with one root table. However, multiple subnets can be associated to the same root table. And you can use a NAT device to enable instances in a private subnet to connect to the internet or other AWS services. But a NAT device will prevent the internet from initiating connections with instances inside your private subnet. A security group acts as a virtual firewall that controls the traffic for one or more instances. You add rules to each security group that allow traffic to or from its associated instances. A network access control list, or network ACL, is an optional layer of security for your VPC that acts as a firewall for controlling traffic in and out of one or more of your subnets.
This concludes the Amazon VPC lesson. The next lesson is Amazon EC2.